Well, we'll start off with a little uh, evaluation exercise. What I have is a quote on the side screens and would just like you to uh, think of how you would evaluate the person's spiritual condition that's writing it. Uh, what would you sort of say about where they are with God? Let me read it for you. On review of my life, I find much, very much, for which I ought to be humbled in the dust. My direct and positive sins are innumerable. My negligence in the Lord's work has been great. I have not, been, I have not promoted his cause, nor sought his glory and honor as I ought. Notwithstanding all this, I am spared till now, and I trust and received into his divine favor through him. How would you evaluate him? Where is he at with God? How close is he feeling? How would you just, how would you evaluate, analyze this quote and as all you know about him? As you're thinking about that, let me introduce myself. My name is Jeff Bennett. The privilege of being the lead pastor here, and if I don't get a chance to say it personally, just a welcome to each of you here this morning, and to our Harbor Online community, welcome to you. So glad you're watching, so glad that you're a part of what God is doing at our church. As we analyze this quote here, we would see that he says, I ought to be humbled, for my direct and positive sins are innumerable. Actually, when he wrote this, he was 70 years old. He's reflecting back on his life, recalling his sin and saying there are too many to count. We might call that the sins of commission, things that he has done. But his self-reflection does not end there. It moves to the sense of his negligence in what he did not do. You know, he has not promoted the cause of God, nor sought his glory and honor. We call those the sins of omission, things we did not do. And he's reflecting on both of those, and by his own words, is very humbled by his past. We look in on this and realize this is a man who's saying, who's looking at himself and looking at God and realizing there is a distance between him. He does not measure up to the standard that God would have for him. There's a distance. There's a separation here. Now, before you might be too hard on him, you can take a moment personally and reflect on your own journey, your own mistakes, your own failures, and you may get, with enough humility, get to the point where you may say, oh yeah, my sins are direct and positive and innumerable. My negligence, my sins of omission are also great. So whether it's him or us, if we're honest with ourselves, we can get to a point where we feel like God is there and we have fallen short. There is some distance between us and God. In fact, it's quite easy, I think, in a moment to get there, to sense that God who we are makes us far away from God, and thus there is the sense of the absence of God or the lack of presence of God, the lack of closeness to God. Now, we can get there quite easily ourselves. In a moment of humility, you can get there and feel a distance between you and God, but sometimes we don't even need to do that, and it's slightly different, the process, but the end is the same. Sometimes situations, circumstances, people, family, crisis, trouble. Sometimes all of those things or one of those things flood into our lives. And again, we feel that God is far away, that God feels absence. Again, a very different journey, but the same result is the same, the distance of God, the lack of presence of God in our lives. We could call it a wilderness. We could call it in the desert where the emotions and the pain and the turmoil of both our own self-reflection or the circumstances of our lives end us up in a desert, dry, far away from God, longing and desperate and pleading for more of God. So who is today for? Who is today for? Today is for anyone who's ever sensed themselves in a spiritual desert, Anyone who's ever sensed that God is far away, 
ever sense that God is absent in their world. Again, the process is different, how we get there. Sometimes it's our own reflection. Sometimes it's the trouble of our world. But either way, we end up sensing the absence of God in our lives. And when we arrive there, when we feel that, what are we to think? How are we to respond? What might we contemplate? What should we do? And that's the nature of where we come today. And we're coming to a psalm. It's Psalm 63. And I hope you have your Bibles. I hope you can find it. It speaks of just such a moment. So if you're new to Christianity and you have a paper Bible and it's got the Old and New Testament, just open it up right to the middle. You will hit Psalms. If English is your second language, in English it's spelled P-S-A-L-M-S, Psalms with that sort of silent P at the beginning. If you're on a digital Bible, you know, it's P-S somewhere in the middle there. Psalms has 150 chapters. We're in number 63. And if you found it while I've been talking, you're going to see it says Psalm 63. And then right underneath it, there's this little description. And we often don't even talk about the little descriptions. But here's what it says. A Psalm of David when he was in the desert of Judah. And so for this psalm, that description is very important because David, he is in a physical desert, but he's also in a spiritual desert. And so he's bringing his physical experience and his spiritual experience, he's bringing them together. He is in a moment where he feels the absence of God and he's longing for God. And let me just tell you why he ends up in the desert. David, at this point, in his kingship, he's the king of Israel. Uh, probably Israel is the world's superpower. So he would be one of, the, if not the richest, most powerful men in the world. And now a coup has been attempted on his kingdom. And so he has fled Jerusalem with some of his close advisors, and he's fled to the desert. And so he is in the desert, in the midst of a crisis, feeling like he's going to lose his kingdom, his wealth, his authority, and most significantly, his life. He's run for his life as the king of Israel. And so if you want a moment in your life where you might feel the absence of God, this would be one of those moments. Right? I have the chance to lose everything, my wealth, my position, and my life. Now, some of you know this story. And it's not just that there was a coup happening in the nation Israel. It's who was leading the coup. And the coup was being led by David's oldest son, Absalom. And so now, the story gets a little more complicated. Now, you have the oldest son trying to kill his father and take everything that his father has. And so the father is fleeing for his life. And so now you see a whole other level of the crisis David's in because it's this family betrayal. It's this family pain. My son is trying to take everything from me and kill me. In fact, it's hard to think of a modern example of a more egregious act of a son against a father. This is extreme. And so again, if you want a circumstance where you might not sense the presence of God, this is that. But then also some of you know the story is even more complicated because you know that in David's early years, he sinned and sinned greatly. He committed adultery with a married woman, and then he sought to cover that up by having her husband murdered, and then he tried to deceive the entire nation. And so David, in his past, murderer, adulterer, deceiver, and he knows, and if you follow, if you know the story of David, what you know is the consequences of those sins spilled out into his family. And so I'm not excusing Absalom for what he is clearly doing in this moment is wrong, trying to kill his father and take the throne. But the other thing that David knows is part of his own sin, part of his past, part of the consequences are now being manifested out into his family. And so you see the two different journeys. He's there now remembering his positive and direct sins, which are innumerable, and he's feeling the weight of his own sin. He's feeling the weight of his son, trying to kill him, and he's feeling the weight of losing all that he has. This is a crisis. 
And it's a point where he feels the absence of God. And then, in this moment, in the desert, he pens these words for us. In A.D. 400, a church father, he reminded his people, he said that not one day should pass without the public singing of this psalm. He just felt it was so important that every believer every day should sing and say this psalm. And so these are the words that David writes as he senses the absence of God in his life. And so let me read them for you today and just follow along. We'll do the first eight verses. You, God, are my God. Earnestly, I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you. In a dry and parched land, where there is no water. I have seen you in your sanctuary. I've beheld your power and glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you all of my days. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. I will be satisfied as with the richest of food, With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. I remember you on my bed. I think of you through the watches of the night. Because you are my help, I sing in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you. Your right hand upholds me. Let me pray. God, we see these sacred words from David. God, as he is in both a physical and a spiritual desert. And oh God, as we look into this this morning, God, may you teach us something. Teach us something about how we can connect with you when you feel so far away. In your name, amen. So what we're going to do is just look at verse 1. We'll look at the other verses in following weeks, and we're going to pull out three things from verse 1 that we can learn when God feels absence. And then right at the end, I'll give us three sort of applications for us as a church. So look how David starts. Look how he starts. He's in the midst of the crisis, and what are the first words out of his mouth? You, God, are my God. In the midst of everything else that's going on, All the emotions are swirling, all the pain, all the turmoil, all the reflection and regret. He just is going to assert one thing. God, you are my God. God alone, nothing else, nothing more. It's just like he's planting his feet in the midst of a whole world of quicksand on one rock. God, in the midst of all that's going on, I'm just standing on you. Now, it would be enough if David said, you, God, are God. That would be a wonderful declaration. It would be, you, God, are God. You're powerful. You're sovereign. Above all, I'm recognizing that you are real and you exist and you are holy and awesome. But you see, he doesn't say, you, God, are God. See what he says? This is so interesting. You, God, are my God. He adds the one little word, two letters, my, to talk about God. And when we use the word my in relation to people, in relation to relationships, it's significant. You know, we're going to see a lot of children all around Harbor today. Some back here, some over there in the Harbor Kids area. But there's only a few parents, there's only a few kids where you're going to say, oh, these are my kids. Or for some of you, you might say, oh, these are my parents or my aunt, my uncle, my niece, my nephew. What's that implying when we put the word my in front? It implies a close relationship. And now David comes in the midst of the crisis and he says, you, God, are my God. I know you personally. And just for a moment, we pause and we say, in the midst of a crisis, In the midst of all that might go on in our lives, can we declare like David declared, God, I know you. We are in relationship. In the midst of all the craziness and all the pain and all the circumstances, we can just cry out and say, God, you are my God. There is this rock that we have beneath our feet. 
can you say that today? Can you say no matter what goes on, no matter what happens, I know God, you are my God. And so I just tried to summarize what we learn in this moment. And it is so important. Here's my first summary. It's simply this, is that we can know God personally. We can know God personally. Not just know about God or know that he exists, but that we can know him personally. Personally, we can be in relationship with him. And again, I would just ask it this way. Have you made this kind of decisive commitment? Do you know God in this way? And see, the reality of our, of our condition is that none of us start out knowing God. We start out separated from him. But yet, God provides a way. God provides a way that we can be in relationship with him. And that bridge is provided through Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. And when we trust in Christ, he has a way. Jesus brings us from our state of being far from God to being in relationship with God where we can cry out, God, you are my God. It's not our works. It's not our energy. It's not our religious activity. It's not our background. It's not our effort. It's not nothing other than just Jesus on the cross. Because of what Christ did on the cross, we can say, I can be in relationship with God. And so we pause on this first point. We just say, Are, do you know that? Today, could you leave here declaring, God, you are my God. And if you're not there with that kind of relationship, oh, wouldn't you come and trust in Christ and put your faith in him and say, it's not my effort, it's not my works, it's not my religion, it's only Jesus and you can leave here celebrating that you are in relationship with Christ. So the first thing we see in Psalm 63, where David starts, his foundation is, I know God personally. God, you are my God. But then he moves and he says something else. Look down to the next line. It's the second idea we see. And he says this, earnestly I seek you. Earnestly I seek you diligently I seek you. I search aft for you. In the King James Version, it translates it, early I seek you. And I think both are good. Early and diligently and earnestly, I search after you. How do you know when someone's met the true and living God? Is they want more of him. They want to pursue him. They want to find him. They want to diligently search out after him. Now let me just create a little bit of a problem, give a little bit of a background that helps us now as we move through this text. David here says, earnestly I seek you. In two other spots in Psalms, he said this, no one seeks after God. So David said here, earnestly I seek you. Over here in other places, no one seeks God. In fact, Paul in writing Romans picks up on that in Romans 3, changes it a little bit, but says the same thing, no one seeks God. And so here we have this tension now, right? Earnestly I seek you, and no one seeks you. So which is true? And let me give this answer. They both are true. And let me tell you how they are both true. In our state, apart from God, no one, not one of us, seek after God. Our hearts are so sinful, we are not capable or able to seek after God. So when David writes earlier, no one seeks God, he's talking about the human condition that not one of us are able. But then you heard this in Quentin's testimony. Right? He was trying to figure it out. Jesus, what about your death? And he didn't understand the resurrection. Then what happened? God began to open his eyes. In John 6.44, it says this. Jesus says these words. No one comes to Jesus, no one comes to him, unless the Father draws us. So in our natural state, we're not seeking after God. But then God, through his grace and his mercy, begins to open our eyes and we begin to seek after him. And then what we just talked about, we see what Christ did. And we trust in Jesus, not in our good works or our effort, but only in Jesus to bring us into relationship. But God doesn't stop there. Then he just continues to keep working. He keeps drawing us. He keeps moving us towards himself. He keeps causing us to seek. And so the order that David writes this in is really important. The first order is, God, you are my God. I'm in relationship with you. Nothing I've done, only because of Jesus. But now, now that I'm in relationship with you, now I'm seeking after you. In the Bible, 
It's not the story of people finding God as a result of seeking him. The story of the Bible is God seeking us and we finding him because he has opened our eyes to find him. So anytime you see a desire for God, anytime you see uh, people wanting to find more of God, that is the work of God in their lives. The mark of God working in us is that we desire more of him. This is the God side of the story. But now in the verse, and I had to sort of give that background, now in the verse we see the David side. David doesn't say, okay, God, well, if you're drawing me to yourself, then I'll just be passive and do nothing. He says, no, no, I'm going to earnestly seek after you. God's creating that in his heart, but he's not passive at all. He wants more of God. He is running towards God. God, may I know you. So here's what we remember when we feel there's an absence of God when we feel like we're in a spiritual desert, one is this great truth is that we can know God personally, and it's like a rock underneath our feet. But then here's the second idea. In those moments, and in every moment, we should seek God earnestly. When we've met God and encountered him and his grace and the relationship he gives us, we should respond by saying, oh God, I seek after you diligently and earnestly with our whole hearts. In fact, us doing that is a sign of his work in our lives. So I can know God personally. I should seek him earnestly. If you're following along, you sort of think this next one is not going to be what we read. But let me show you, it's not what we think. Here's what David says next. All of verse 1, I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. We're back to the desert. It, it, this is a literal desert where it's dry and weary, but it's a spiritual desert. David's saying, I just don't feel spiritually connected to God. I feel dry and waterless, and he's thirsting. His entire being's longing for God. And this psalm is a psalm of longing. It's a psalm of David seeking out after God. If you keep reading, he's going to reflect back on his past. He's going to look forward to the future with confidence. But in the present, it's just a psalm of unsatisfied longing. It's just David saying, God, I don't sense your presence, but oh, how I desire it and desire more of it. If someone was to say to you today, they're hungry, Again, this is not, um, if they would just say to you, they're hungry, here's what you would think. Oh, they have a lack of food in their body, in their stomach. I'm going to get them some food. In the same way, if someone was to say to you, I'm thirsty, you would say, oh, would you like something to drink? Can I get you some water? Can I get you a beverage? Here, David says, I thirst. I thirst. And he's saying there's a lack of something in his life, and it is the lack of the presence of God. And he's longing for more of God. And so here's the third reality. One is, in a, in a desert, we can know God personally. We should seek him earnestly. But my third idea is this. We do sense God's absence deeply. We can come to a spot where we just feel like God is absent. But as you would ponder that, and even in your own journey, feeling that God is far away, no matter how you get there. Sometimes it's our own sin and own reflection on that. Sometimes it's circumstances. But let me try, if I can explain it well, give an encouragement also in this moment that can help reshape that moment where we feel the absence of God. See, in order for you to feel the absence of God, what we talked about earlier is God must be working. In order for you to have a longing for God, God must be creating the longing. In order for you to want to seek after God, God must be present creating the seeking. And so this is summarized a lot of places. I thought Tim Keller did the best and then I altered his. But here's the principle. Here's the principle. You see it on the side screens. The sense of God's absence is a sign of God's presence. The sense of God's absence is a sign of God's presence. Go talk to David in this moment. David's going to say, God, I'm just thirsting after you. Where are you? And you're going to say, David, that you feel that way, that you are thirsting after God is a sign that he is actually at work in your life. God's absence is his presence. 
God's absence is a sign of his work in your life. Some of you need to write down that principle, spend some time thinking about it this week, but it's wonderfully helpful when you can get your head around it and all the theology that comes behind it. Because next time you feel that God is absent in your world, here's what you can say, I wouldn't be upset. I wouldn't be upset. This wouldn't bother me unless God was right here with me, making it bother me, drawing me, and helping me seek after him. And so if we remember that, it can be a wonderful moment where we feel encouraged that God is actually at work in that moment. Now, it doesn't get David out of the desert. He's still in the desert. But if he can remember it, he can say, God, the sense of your absence is a sign of of your presence in my life. Some of you need this encouragement this morning. Some of you are feeling the absence of God and the fact that you are feeling it is a sign that God is present, working in you, drawing him to yourself. And so let's go back to the quote I started with. Remember the, the, uh, the great and innumerable sins. What's this person's spiritual condition? Well, he gives us a little hint at the end. He says those great two words, through him, through Christ, which means everything else that he's written, what's he counting in? Only in Jesus to bring him safely to God. But what else might we know about this person? We would say this, he truly knows who he is and he truly knows who God is. And he's feeling a distance. But the way we know someone is moving towards God is when they feel so far from him. The further we feel from God is in sometimes the more we have come to know God. He knows himself and he knows his God. This is actually a quote by William Carey. If you know him, he was what we call the father of modern missions. 200 years ago, headed to India, saw God use him greatly in India. His impact is still felt there today. But as he reflected on his life at 70 years, these were his words. And to me, it's a sense of a man who deeply knows God because he knows how far he is from him. He knows who he is and who his God is. And so my hope this morning, as we've gone through this first verse, is that God may use his word to create in all of us, our church combined, a thirsting and a hunger to seek after God. That his work among us through his scripture, through his spirit, would be that, ah, that we would want to pursue with earnestness and seek after God more. And so what I want to do simply is present three practical ways that we all can do that together. One that takes maybe a whole year or shorter, six months. One that takes two weeks and one that takes one day. I hope that you do all three of them. hope you do all three. But if you can't do all three, I hope that you will for sure choose one of these three. And let me just tell you how I sort of arrived at these three and why I've chosen these three applications for how we can see God. Uh, I drive a very old minivan, and, uh, and I just enjoy it fine. The heat doesn't quite work in the winter, but we just go along just fine. But Quentin's here, and he tried to rent a car to come, and they ran out of cars, so they gave him this wonderful Jeep. And we get in this Jeep yesterday to go around. It's like, for me, it's like the space shuttle. I'm like, wow, there's a screen, there's buttons. It was just so wonderful. I was like, wow, this is what they make cars to look like these days. It was a great surprise to me. But Quentin, I'm sure as you came and all those buttons on there, I'm thinking what's on there is some cruise control. Right, you're going to drive home to Montreal today, uh, put that cruise control on. You still have to drive, but cruise control is nice on a vehicle. Less work, less energy, it's comfortable, it's predictable, you know, it's consistent. You just go along at the same speed all the time. Wonderful on cars if you enjoy it. But as you think about cruise control, in our spiritual lives, cruise control is not so good. In our spiritual lives, it can be easy to just go along comfortably, consistently, predictably, you know, it's less work, it's less energy, and we just sort of go along in our seeking after God. And so as we read David's words today, where he says, earnestly I seek you, I pray that God would develop in us a greater earnestness to pursue him. And so, yes, we should be reading our Bibles and praying, and those would be the first two on my list, but I tried to choose three applications that may sort of stir us out of cruise control and cause us to do some different things. And so you'll see on the screens three things I'm asking of you. There's a book by Jerry Bridges written in 1994 called The Discipline of Grace. It is a wonderful book. 
wonderful book that will help you understand the great depth of God's grace and the great way we can earnestly seek after him. Some of you maybe haven't read a book all year. Some of you haven't read a Christian book all year. But would you, over the next year, read and take in the contents of this book? It is outstanding. That's why it's lasted some of the test of time. And would you let these words sink into your soul? Would you read it slowly and absorb it? It's available on Kindle. I, we may still have some copies left. More coming, Lord willing, this week, $25. You can sign up or buy them at the welcome desk today. That's for the year. Second thing I would ask of all of us, would you memorize the first eight verses of Psalm 63? I tried to do it this morning. I had the screen on the back to help me a little bit, so I'm thankful for that. But I've tried to memorize it over this last year and just let the words of this psalm seek into my heart. And so for the next two weeks, four verses this week, four verses next week, would you seek to memorize Psalm 63? We put a little card on your, row of, uh, on your chairs there. On the back, all the words are there. There's more at the welcome desk if you'd like. And put that up somewhere, just a good little guide on how to memorize it. Next week, we'll start the message by all of us standing and saying the psalm together. Don't worry if you haven't memorized it. We'll still be on the side screens. But hopefully those of you that have memorized some, we can say it out loud together. And then my third application is fasting, fasting and prayer. We as a church fast and pray every first Wednesday. We don't often mention it or make a big deal about it, but it's just part of our routine. We as a church want to be a place where we're calling on God, where we're fasting from food and we're praying and we're earnestly seeking after him for his work in our midst. So next, in 10 days from now, September 1st, is a first Wednesday, and I would ask that every single one of us participate on that day in some measure of fasting. Now, I know some of you have medical conditions or work things where, where it just doesn't make it possible. There's grace there, but here would be my request. Don't try to find a way to get out of the fasting. Try to find a way to get into the fasting. And so if you've never fasted before, maybe you would just fast one meal just give up one meal and seek the Lord and pray. Again, there's another little insert. On the back, there's verses to be prayed over. Why we fast and how we fast. For some of you, you fast a meal before. Would you fast a day? For some of you have fasted a day, would you fast two days? Here's my request. Would you fast more next week than you ever have before? Would you fast more than you ever have before? And may it just be a way that we would earnestly seek after God. David says in the midst of his desert, Oh God, you are my God. And as he's met God, what's working in his life is, Oh God, earnestly I seek after you. I thirst for you. My whole body longs for you. May God create that more in our hearts as a church as we move into the fall. Let me pray for us this morning. God, thank you for these words of David that have been so appreciated and sung over centuries. And oh God, we pray, Lord, that you would use David's desert experience to create in us a greater longing and thirst after you. God, thank you, Lord, that as we pursue you in these things, you increase our appetite for you. And so God, may we do things that increase our appetite. And oh God, may you save us from those appetite thing, that things that destroy and ruin our appetite for you. And so, God, work in our hearts, Lord. May you create in us, Lord. God, we desire to thirst after you. We desire to seek after you. God, grow that in us, I pray in your name. Amen. We end each service always with four words. It reminds us of the mission we are on. And before I say those four words, let me not forget, please introduce yourself to Quentin. Please welcome him here. Please give him your email. Please connect with him. That would be of great value to us as we really are sending him to Quebec to be our person there, our partner there in spreading the gospel. And so Harbor, we are sent.